So for you who were here last week, we took a look at why bad things happen to good people. We're going to continue on that same trend this week. So last week I suggested three foundational ideas to understand suffering. First, that human beings have a responsibility for what happens on earth. And second, God has given us free will. And third, we're just not great about making our choices with the free will that we've been given. We also learned last week that God does not cause suffering, either by natural disaster or by illness. However, God also does not take away our freedom to deliver us from the consequences of our actions or the actions of others. So, and through all of last week's discussions, I hope that you heard repeatedly that God is with us in our suffering, and God's power is love, and that God's love often works through people. We act in God's love, then we can ease suffering, and love always wins in the end. Okay, very logical. That's sort of the explanation about why we suffer. But it really doesn't address the purpose of suffering or the meaning of suffering or our response to suffering. And so that's what we're going to talk about this week. I really don't like to suffer myself. Living through suffering is like living in a scream where there's no exit, just echo. Physical and emotional pain can wear you down. It can just grind on you until you're raw. And you are almost unable to respond rationally. This week I've been reading many of the follow-up articles on the one year anniversary from the, an the shooting in Arizona. And these articles all have hopeful endings. But in each article, you can really feel the anguish of those victims. Some people are still have shaking anxiety from the trauma that they experienced on that day. The suffering for these people is real. These people have been hurt. And yet they've also each found a path through their suffering to a new normal, a new way of being in the world, reshaped by that tragedy. Nina Donnelly suggested in her book, I Never Know What to Say, that suffering is a time of testing. Now, to be clear, it's not God <coughs> testing you, but we test who we are and what we believe. Suffering is a test of where we find our hope and our strength and our faith and our love. So in suffering, do we rely on painkillers and alcohol to numb us? Do we look to sex to soothe our loneliness? Do we become angry and vengeful, seeking to assign blame and sue somebody? Or do we hide in the shelter of our home, like one of the victims of Arizona shooting, refusing to step outside for anyone, ever? Or do we turn to God in prayer? God is not the cause for our suffering, but our help. Today we heard David's poetry in Psalm 139, describing God's continual, close, intimate presence. Daniel says, David says, you are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take wings and fly out to the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. Even the darkest, the darkness is not dark to you. Think about that. Even when we 
Make our bed in dark, slippery Sheol. God will see us and find us and hold us tight. Like a child crying out in the night for their mother, crying out from the depths of a nightmare, we can cry out for God. And like a mom, God will comfort us, hold us tight, and will calm our souls. Author Kent Nurburn, in his book, Simple Truths, says that times of suffering can be times of growth. And so the question we ask ourselves is not if we will heal, but how. Grief and pain have their duration, and when they begin to pass, we must take care to guide the shape of the new being we are to become. I would say it a little bit differently because I feel God is present in our suffering. I would say that we work with God in the shaping of our new being. God will help us create the meaning and purpose for our suffering. Think about it. Veterans healing from combat wounds are willing to work very hard at rehab. Their suffering came as a result of their service, serving their country. They see the pain as a consequence of doing something worthwhile. And so they strive for healing. It's not the same as someone who's had a sports accident or um, was out partying and twisted and broke something. They, they feel that there's no good reason to be hurt or that they're to blame themselves and so they often don't work hard to overcome their limitations. Rabbi Krishner says that bad things happen to us in our lives <coughs> do not have meaning when they happen to us. Rather, with God's support, we give them meaning, placing the blame, searching for a villain, accusing others only adds to our loneliness. We need to live for something, not just against something. So my first year of seminary, I was diagnosed with breast cancer, and it kind of put me into a confused tailspin for a while. Because I had gone to seminary because I felt God's calling on my life. Now, if God calls you and tells you to go to seminary, you go. If God tells you to be a preacher, you do it. And yet, how are you going to do that when you have cancer? So, was that a bump in the road? Or was that a block trying to turn me in a new direction? I didn't really know at the time. But I prayed to God, how are you going to use me now? And I learned that with God's help, I'm a lot stronger than I thought I was. And I learned that what I saw as a weakness blocking me actually became a door to help other people. I couldn't imagine anything good coming from illness at that point. But Romans reminds us we know that all things work together for good of those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. Now, I'm not suggesting that when something bad happens that you don't rail and yell, why? That's okay to do that. Or that you get mad at God, that's fine, God's big enough, you can handle that. And there may be a period of darkness when you can't feel God's presence, it's okay. Those in our congregation will gather around you to help you through that time. I'm saying that we are to go to God in prayer to find out how all things are going to work together for good. So much of our prayer is in, um, accessory prayer, intercessory prayer. And so that's okay, because we are taught to ask God for what we need. Jesus said to, told us to ask, and it will be given to you. Because like a caring father, the God will give the Holy Spirit to those that asked. You can find that in Luke 11. But note that what God gives us is not material things, but Holy Spirit, not instant solutions. God invites us into a relationship <clears throat> through prayer. And as we slowly yield our lives to God in prayer, it becomes less of a transaction and more of a communion with God. 
We learned to direct God less and listen to God more. And we begin to feel a more intimate connection with God and prayer begins to redeem our loneliness and our isolation. This example of this <coughs> in Genesis, in the story of Jacob. Jacob has stolen his elder, bro elder brother's blessing and he's fleed his homeland. And scared and alone, he prays, if God be with me and will keep me and give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, then the Lord shall be my God and all that you give me I will give you one-tenth. He's bargaining with God. If you look after me, then I'll give you a tenth back. But doesn't that sound like us? He'll mean God and, and I'll go to church every week. Fix my child or grandchild and, and I'll, I'll up my donations. I'll do more good works. Don't we tend to want to do that because it's sort of under our control? God's not looking for our bargains or our deals. Grace is free. Jesus cleared the way for us. Centuries and centuries ago, he play, paid the price so that we could always go to God. Forgiveness is always waiting for our repentance. God's love is always waiting to help heal us. When Jacob returns to his homeland 20 years later, and a bit more mature, he's afraid to face that brother. And he prays, God, I'm not worthy of your steadfast love and faithfulness. I'm afraid. Deliver me from the hand of my brother. He just goes to God in his moment of need, opening his heart, no bargaining. When we turn to God in prayer, when we learn to listen like Samuel learned to listen, then God has a chance to walk with us through that suffering through our life changes and help transform it and use it for the improvement of our lives or the lives of many. When we listen to God, then God can nudge us and show us how to be God's instruments. God intends us to be the answer to prayer. Both our prayers and the prayers of others. God's love works through people. There's a Jewish saying, human beings are God's language. Now, Linda's not here today, but I spent some time at the Boyd household, and Alan Boyd has um, a tattoo on his forearm from Mark 10. It says, all things are possible with God. His God-supported determination after his stroke helped him heal. But that same gutsy determination and the inscription on his arm that brought him into therapy every day also inspired other people who weren't at that point of acceptance yet to go and do their therapy. Look at our prayer list today and <coughs> look at the suffering that's on there. A mother of the people that live just across the street has died. Her family is hurting. There are people who are ill. Donnie just got home from the hospital this week. And Dan Stone just got home from the hospital this week. Thank goodness Melvin's not in or out of the hospital this week. He had a good week. Uh, Jean Fox isn't here today because she's still being with her family because her granddaughter Cecilia had brain surgery to remove a tumor at the base of her head. You know, as a grandparent, that hurts. You can't magically fix it. And so what can you do but pray? Just offering your heart to God, not in the bargaining, God, you fix my granddaughter, you can take me. Not that kind of prayer. Just God be with that little girl. In all of these people's suffering. God can give them the strength to face each new day, to find a ray of hope, <coughs> to 
feel God's peace and to have a little bit of joy. And through God's prayer, we can also taste God's divine outrage at the injustices of this world. Oh, one of my Facebook friends told of um, a mentally retarded three-year-old turning up at, I think it's Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, and they were going to sit down with a nephrologist and discuss a kidney transplant. And the family had already begun testing to find out who in the family would be a likely kid, uh, kidney donor to this little girl. <coughs> and the nephrologist says, we don't do kidney transplants on retarded children. We just don't do it. Because their quality of life, you're extending a life that doesn't have enough quality. And the parents were outraged. When we feel that outrage of unfairness, that's God's word in us, motivating us to correct that. God can energize us to help others, to share our wealth, to cook and care for the homeless, to share the good news and welcome strangers into our church, like last week when we made room for a cat. God's power is God's love, and God's love most always works through God's people. Prayer helps us to listen to God so that we can act in God's love to transform the suffering into something purposeful. And God's love always wins in the end. Amen.